All right, guys, um, we're going to do a qu very quick overview of absolutism in Spain. And again, absolutism is when a monarch has absolute, total, and complete control of their empire. They are beholden in answer to no one. Royals, monarchs, who are able to have a secure financial base, who have a direct access to cash, can become independent of not only the old world nobles, but of legislatures and parliaments. And the place that exemplifies this better than any other are the Habsburgs in Spain. Spain has got a massive and large territory throughout the world, not only in just Europe, but the Habsburgers, Hab, Habsburgers, excuse me, Habsburgs, uh, it's the end of the day here. The Habsburgs control not only a European empire, but an empire scattered throughout the globe. They rule from Spain and Portugal on the Iberian Peninsula to Sicily and Naples on one of the Italian trading states to their empire in the New World in Mexico and Peru, even as far out into the Pacific and Asia as the Philippines. And the absolute monarch who has all of this <coughs> is Emperor Charles V, and he is going to rule Spain in one of its two golden ages. He's going to govern from, say, 1500 to 1558, when the Habsburg Empire is at its greatest size. This thing is enormous. The global power that Charles has is incredible. He's got an enormous head start on everybody else. And again, it's the money from transatlantic trade that is going to be used to fuel absolutism. And the Spanish are out in front because they're getting the gold from Mexico and the silver from Peru, from Cortez and Pizarro and the Patesi silver mine. And so through one set of Charles' grandparents, Queen Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain, he gets the empire in the Americas. So he gets Spain and then the empire in the Americas. From his other set of grandparents, who are Austrian, he gets Austria, the Netherlands, and the Holy Roman Empire, much of the 360 German states. So it's a European as well as an international empire. However, poor Charles finds it very difficult to rule so many lands. In Europe, we've got the Protestant Reformation going on. Many of the German princes want to do their own thing. You know, we got the Peace of Augsburg, where everybody can pick their own religion. And so, you know, in Spain, Charles is just, ah, there's just something constantly always to do. And his subjects in Spain absolutely love him. They respect him. He is one of them. But unfortunately, Charles is going to squander Spain's almost inexhaustible amount of riches fighting many wars against first the French and then the Turks and just about everybody else. And so by 1556, when, when Charles should have just saved all that money going into his coffers in, in, in Sevilla, a lot of it is blown on religious wars. So at this point, Charles V does something radical, something that no one had ever thought that he would do, and that is he divides the empire between his brother and his son, Charles V, just taps out. He quits. He leaves the throne. And Charles felt that governing one empire as big as his empire was, was just too much for any one person to govern. So he gives the Austrian part of his empire, you know, the hills are alive with the sound of music. He gives the Austrian part of his 
of the empire to his brother, Ferdinand. You get Austria, Austrian Habsburg Empire that will last until World War I. Everything else goes to his son, Philip. Philip gets the Holy Roman Empire. He gets the Spanish Empire in the Americas. He gets the Netherlands and the Italian trading city, port city of Naples. So Philip gets all the really good stuff. And so this ushers in the reign of Philip II. In this green shaded areas, for you guys who aren't really good with geography, the green shaded areas from Spain here to um, Sicily, Naples, you know, Austria, up to the Netherlands, a Holy Roman Empire, all the green stuff, here's France, here's Great Britain, all of that belongs to the Habsburgs. That's just in Europe, let alone their other worldwide empires. And so Philip II's reign is known as the Second Golden Age of Spain. Under Philip II, Spain is going to go this great, glorious transformation from 1556 to 1598. Spain becomes by far and away the, the richest, most powerful nation in Europe. They've got a big head start over even France and Louis XIV and the Stuarts up, up in England. Spain is out in front because they're getting wealth coming back from all over the empire. Right? It's all economics. The flotilla system, the Spanish fleets, are coming back with treasure from Spain, from Peru, the gold and the silver. It's pouring in all over the place. The Spanish Navy, the Armada, is powerful, and the Spanish, who are devout Catholics, are sending out their missionaries, not only across Europe to Protestant-held territories, but to the empires in the Americas that are just brand new areas for conversion, to bring souls to Christianity. And Philip II himself is a passionate, devoted Catholic. All right? And along with being a passionate, devoted Catholic, he is also passionate about running his empire. He is a hands-on guy like Louis XIV in France, like Peter the Great of Russia, he wanted to have his hand and an input on everything that went on, on the national level. Now, small, local, little levels, Philip doesn't have time for that. But he is going to manage and make decisions that affect his entire empire. So he works almost tirelessly. This is a hallmark, one of the things that all great absolute monarchs do. They're hands-on, they're in touch, they know what's going on. And so he is going to get that small cabinet, that small advisory staff. I have Patricia here, I have Nicole there, I have Kevin, I have Henry, I got Anne Marie. I got my small cabinet, five or six people. These are people that I can spend hours of time with every day getting input, making decisions, and making sure they are carried out. That's what Philip does. He's deeply in tune with running his country. But he also devotes his energy not only to running the country, and here's Philip, but also he wants to get rid of heretics. He wants his empire to be... The epitome, he wants to restore the unity of the Roman Catholic Church throughout Europe. He wants to reunify Europe under Catholicism. Since he's so big and so rich and so powerful, and he controls all of this land, he believes he can do it. And so he's going to send missionaries out across Europe, the brave ones going into Protestant Europe, and across the New World. Unfortunately, this is going to cause Philip to get involved in many wars that are going to drain the almost inexhaustible wealth of Spain. He's got so much money, just save a little bit of it. And the problems start way up in the Netherlands, way up in the North Sea. 
The Netherlands, as we know for a long time, have been a small but powerful trading empire, all right, going, you know, out in, 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 into the, the world, the Dutch East India Trading Company and all of that. Um, and at this time, Philip is even wealthier than Louis XIV of France is going to be. And it was Philip's efforts to completely and centralize and dominate Spain that leads him into a struggle with his citizens in the Netherlands. This is part of his empire. Now, the Netherlands had been the small but powerful trading empire. They were growing economically on the power of their fleets and, as I said, the Dust India Company. Problem is, the people of the Netherlands never felt part of Philip's empire. Like, they were part of it, but Philip always seemed to put the interest of Spain above them. They were a secondary or tertiary part of his empire. And Philip says, well, yeah, I'm Spanish. I live in Spain. You're the Netherlands. Like, I... I might like the tulips, but I'm not a big fan of Amsterdam, so yeah, I'm going to put them ahead of you because, well, I live in Spain, not in the Netherlands. And it was religious differences that are going to kick this off. In the Netherlands, there are seven provinces who want to be Protestant states. They want to declare themselves independent of Philip. You want a Catholic empire, due to Martin Luther's Reformation, we want to be Protestants. And Philip says, no, 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 no. We are going to be united under Catholicism. So he sends some soldiers up there and he says, do not, do not go in there and kill civilians. That is the very last thing that I want you to do. Well, the army goes in, protest here, protest there, there's no oversight, and the Spanish army kills 18,000 Dutch civilians. The worst possible thing that could happen for Spain and Philip II. This angers not only people in the Netherlands, but across the sea, the English Channel, is Protestant England, all right, where the Tudors are Henry VIII and Elizabeth II. The Netherlands was a growing naval powerhouse, and they often traded with England and other parts of Europe, and now Spain just killed 18,000 of them. And Queen Elizabeth I is especially concerned about this. Now, she was afraid that once Spain was done defeating the Netherlands, they were going to turn on their logical enemy, England. So, Queen Elizabeth, therefore, um, is a little shifty. Um, she allows her English sea captains to become privateers. And a privateer is like legalized piracy. It's deniability. Oh, go capture those Spanish ships, but we didn't do it. Now, Elizabeth says, you know, I'm afraid that he's going to come here because we're Protestants. And the very best sea captain that Queen Elizabeth had was Sir Francis Drake. Probably the most successful pirate of all time. And he goes out and he captures Spanish vessels. Not only the powerful Spanish ship, the Spanish galleon, like your Black Pearls, but also the treasure and money on them, and it's sent back to England. And King Philip is angry, and he writes a letter. It says, Elizabeth, one of your guys is attacking my ships. I got no beef with you right now, but listen to me there, young lady. He attacks one more daggone ship, and it might mean war. And Elizabeth says, well, spitzball, tribute, God save the queen and all that. Don't you worry there, Philip, old boy. You know, by bangers and mash, I will make sure that, you know, um, he, you know, stops doing that. You know, I promise all of my fishing ships that he will stop or, or else I'll be very cross with him. I'll be very cross, um, I will. And Elizabeth's going like, yeah, keep going, Sir Francis. So Sir Francis is recalled. 
And he's taken to London where he believes, let him believe he's going to be punished. And some spies and courtiers from Philip's, you know, staff in Spain are writing, ooh, you're going to get it now, Sir Francis, or Francis Drake. And he's told to kneel in front of the king. And they're like, dude, is she going to be at him right here in front of us? Queen Elizabeth, not only does she not execute him, but she knights him for doing a good job by the power of St. George and St. John, whatever you are now, hereby, Sir Francis Drake. And Philip is absolutely furious. You can't do that. It's one more, one final insult to Philip II, and he decides enough is enough. I'm going to handle business. And so he does. Philip II, in 1588, is going to send his pride and joy to first deal with the Netherlands and then handle merry old England. He's going to send up 68 ships of the enormous Spanish Armada. On board are 60,000 Spanish soldiers. They sail out into the English Channel, which you have the North Sea Current and the Atlantic Ocean Current. They're compressed between Great Britain and mainland Europe, and so the water is always choppy and wavy. And these ships sail in there. And there's a combination here of bad weather and Spanish hubris, overconfidence. And the storm begins to rage. And the boats are rocking and rolling and they throw up their anchors. And to give a more stable platform, some of the ships lash themselves together. Now, if these 60,000 soldiers put boots on the ground in Great Britain, Queen Elizabeth can't stop them. And she famously dresses in armor and goes to rally her, her troops. In the midst of this storm, she unleashes Sir Francis Drake into the English Channel. Now, the English are adept at the weather patterns of the English Channel and the sailing conditions, and they have smaller, lighter, but more maneuverable ships. Very similar to Themistocles of ancient Athens, taken on the Persian um, uh, navy in the Battle of Salamis or the Straits of Artemisium, Sir Francis Drake and his guys go out there and they wreak havoc on the mighty Spanish Armada, attacking the Armada. They destroy many of the Spanish ships. Those that do survive have to sail all the way up and around and come back down defeated. Sir Francis Drake not only saves the Netherlands, but England from invasion. And this gives England the feeling of invincibility on the sea. The seas belong to us. The mighty Spanish Armada has just been beaten. And it stinks. And that's going to signal the end of Spanish, the Spanish era of dominance. But in between the reign of Charles V and the sinking of the Spanish Armada in 1588, um, Spanish culture is going to blossom, especially under Philip. Um, it's known as the century of gold. This is when great masterpieces of art and literary masterpieces like Don Quixote from Miguel Cervantes is going to be written. And so it's going to be, you know, a lot of the patronage and the wealth and the gold coming from overseas trade that drives all of this. However, the century of gold doesn't quite begin to last a century. The Spanish had become accustomed to their gold and silver coffers filling up every six months from the flotilla system. They expected just as much gold to become pouring in. They never suspected that gold and silver was a limited supply. 80% of the world's silver, for a small time, came out of one mine in Peru, the Patesi silver mine. So Spain just figures, well, no matter what, I'm going to keep getting more. The treasury will be replenished. 
The only problem is, all of a sudden, the amount of ore, gold and silver ore, begins to dwindle. And the many wars that Spain was fighting with France and with Turkey and with everybody else, they begin to deficit spend. Well, we'll spend this money now, like putting it on a credit card, knowing the gold and silver will come in and we can pay back that bill later. But as less and less amounts of precious ore come in, the more behind the Spanish fall. Their riches in the Americas begin to run out. And Spain has spent money they don't have, whoops, they don't have in their pocket yet. And so Philip is scrambling. How am I going to do this? My royal treasury in Sevilla is now empty. And Spain also begins to have problems governing its territory in the New World. They need more governors, you know, they need more laborers, they need more, more ways to bring the wealth back. And now a good part of the armada was sunk, and we don't have the money to rebuild it. Building ships is expensive. And so Philip II and his descendants begin to borrow money from bankers in Germany and in Italy. The one time richest king in Europe has got to borrow money. And the treasure that does, not, that does make it back from the New World, instead of going into Philip's savings account, has to go to pay bill collectors. So Philip isn't just keeping his head above water, he is sinking. To make matters worse, there is a massive period of inflation inside of Spain. And so foreign goods from like England or France or elsewhere, were cheaper than buying Spanish goods. And so the Spanish merchants are losing money, causing Philip taxes. And so the reign of Philip II ends in 1660. And within 100 years, when Louis XIV and, and Peter the Great are reaching their, their, their high points, the amount of troubles inside Spain were just too much for the Habsburgs to, to, to deal with. Religious persecution, trying to get rid of heretics and Protestants, caused many to flee the country. Agricultural production nosedives. Industrial production is too expensive and falls off. And the old rivalries between different regions of Spain that could be united by the power and wealth of the Habsburgs begin to work against each other. Nobody saw themselves as a part of an empire as a whole. They looked after their own local region first. And so the one-time richest, most powerful monarchy in Europe with its wealth coming in from overseas kind of falls to a second-tier, second-string European power. They were no longer able to dominate or direct events on the continent. Now that is in Spain, and not, you know. However, the Habsburg family in Austria and the Holy Roman Empire remain vibrant. They maintain and even increase their power and they are able to play a role in world affairs through World War I, through 1918. But in Spain, this brief, glorious 1500 to maybe 1660, is it barely 200 years? Their head start was enormous. Again, it's like those people who, how the lottery ruined my life. Well, the only way you could, that could be is if you made some of the absolute worst choices of all time, which is what Philip and his dad make. Um, Spain will never again be as powerful as they were under Charles V and Philip II. Maybe Charles V had it right. Sometimes you need to just maintain, but unfortunately that is not what happened. Alright guys, that is Spanish absolutism, a very quick overview. Tomorrow we head over to Ottoman Turkey. I will see you guys then.